This takes us to the second part of our overview and wrap up and that's about government. How do the structures and schemes of governments on different sectors of environmental management present themselves and operate? Obviously, they follow the pattern set by the statutory formulations. We have two sets of administration. <clears throat> the forest, wildlife and biodiversity, the green brigade and the pollution control, waste management and impact assessment, the brown sahibs. Each with a different kind of a mindset and approach. The former remind us of <clears throat> the colonial brown sahibs with a typical bureaucratic approach of revenue administration in total charge and control of all that they survey. What about the latter? <clears throat> they being fairly recent to the task are indeed green hands struggling to perfect the art, craft and skills of a very demanding profession. Let us begin with the environmental administration <clears throat> of the brown kind the pollution control, waste management, etc. You remember that they had their roots in science and technology ministry <clears throat> and from that they have come a long way under the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. With the Environment Protection Act <clears throat> opening the doors wide to impose with a heavy, heavy workload, they really reel under them with their ever-expanding tasks, which is not confined to, as was originally visualized, <clears throat> to only Water and Air Act alone. But let us take a re-look at it. <clears throat> These were envisioned, designed and brought into existence for one singular purpose. The idea was to move away from the routine common law and criminal law regime of nuisance law, of general import, to a more specialized, autonomous, legal regime of pollution control, PCBs, endowed with technically competent and professionalized personnel and under EPA, Environment Protection Act, they had expanded tasks and these functionaries now are designated as environment officers and they have become the primal nodal bodies to operationalize many of the rules, regulations and notifications under Environment Protection Act to deal with a wide variety of environmentally degrading activities to provide the shield, safeguards, to protect, conserve, maintain and manage different aspects of environment. <clears throat> Remember it started with noise pollution, broadening the ambit of our understanding of air pollution to include noise pollution also way back in 1987 as we have seen. And that has extended to <coughs> a whole range of activities that include EIA, chemical accidents, waste of various descriptions and varieties like biomedical, lead acid batteries, hazardous, electronic, construction, plastic, solid waste and what have you. And that imposes a host of roles and responsibilities of different kind on them. I must say of all the functionaries of the state that we have in India, not just in the environmental administration, even the forest and wildlife authorities are no match. This body is quite unique, the pollution control boards. Their status, their role, their functions are mind-blowing, unprecedented and unparalleled. What kind of roles they play? 
just to recount fact finder inspector investigator sampler analyst evaluator let me draw some breath it is not over controller regulator approving authority if you look at the consent provision or approving coastal zone management plans coordinator as nodal agency for various rules and regulations educator of me you and everyone awareness campaigns but that is not over they are also trainers they train the industry and other agencies of state <sighs> are their functions over no 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 they are also the function of a doer what do you mean they also have an assignment to do thyself and collect the administrative costs and expenses you remember in the pollution control regime if certain conditions are laid down for consent if the occupier of the premises confesses and with folded hands comes before the authorities and then say look whatever instructions you have given we are not able to comply kindly help us comply with whatever instructions you have given us and pollution control board is supposed to carry out those exercises for the industry and of course correct administrative and other costs so you should not just be a preacher you should also be a performer you should not only talk but you should walk the talk and that's the level of proficiency that is expected of the pollution control boards in performing their functions is their job over no we have only scratched the surface they are also directors they oversee the working of other authorities and local bodies and give instructions to them although they are created under different laws when it comes to the issues which these people are addressing under this law which is an overarching law they sit in judgment over others actions commissions or omissions instruct them guide them if you do not follow then certain penal sanctions would follow that is the command that is the authority of the pollution control board they are also added to that it's an icing to the cake they are also adjudicators every decision every order every instruction made by them is like an order or a decree of a court of law quasi judicial authorities they are it may not be surprising after having very quickly gone through it if you exclaim the only role of a creator is left not being given to them and it is with lord brahma actually not i think the law maker has been a little merciful after having given these many functions to perform it has given a few concessions of assigning some of the functions like those under those rules that you have on hazardous microorganisms science and technology ministry people will take care of that or on eco sensitive zones well it is being assigned to <coughs> various other authorities especially the forest and the wildlife people thanks for this small mercies but really it is back breaking but having assigned with that at least you should give it to the law maker that they have so much of trust in this authority but should it not equip them well both under law in its content and in its working there are so many problems and dilemma look into their composition starting from the chairman and membership it is highly politicized and bureaucratized the boards are not treated with a kind of respect as a professional expert deserves look into its relationship 
the relationship between the central pollution control board and state pollution control board very fragile and tenuous we have seen that and it can create havoc emergency situations and what about the pollution control board's relationship with other agencies of state does that exist or with courts of law you must have seen and we have had umpteen number of examples pollution control boards have become the favorite whipping boy of the courts of law given this state of affairs and to add to this insult to injury you have several bodies to aid guide advise and instruct them of them you have regional offices of the ministry of environment forest and climate change and regional offices of central pollution control board as a matter of fact these bodies utility and value are still not very clear many a time you start wondering are they duplicating the functions of cpcb but they are there turn inwards to the pollution control boards what about their preparation and equipment are they at least geared up to take on the challenges before them in terms of their education academic qualifications experience and expertise as is required in handling the task assigned and meeting the ever expanding demands and expectations we have already seen that none of these are adequately addressed internally also if you look at the mindset and set minds of these functionaries themselves within these boards even that is not in tune with the constitutional directive of a public trustee their actions if you just look at the results of their actions it's more of a reaction than a pro action which is one of their mandates <clears throat> if you just look at their variety of functions some functions stand out some function draw their attention much more than most of the other functions like the consent provision the standard setting and enforcement of that it looks like an approach is more towards rent seeking controls and regulation of conduct than that of a parent educator enabler and facilitator which we saw are many of the functions assigned to them which is very much in line with the constitutional directive of a public trustee but as a matter of fact <clears throat> a closer deeper clearer examination of these rules regulations and notifications the processes and procedures under these laws most of these believe me are capable of getting addressed in the existing system itself only thing is there has to be a rigorous capacity building exercises for all the concerned and of course <clears throat> a few amendments in the existing law is required to bring in a little bit more clarity in the substance of the law primarily to ensure institutional autonomy and to narrow the scope of political interference and also to gain ensure <clears throat> and command cooperation of other agencies of state it is on these some reforms are required then the next stage would be overall reform <clears throat> by way of consolidation of all these laws why you have a separate law on water and air pollution <clears throat> and why you duplicate many of these aspects in environment protection act i think you need have to wrap them all around into absorption and incorporation in the environment protection act itself and there should be a further consolidation of those host of rules and regulations and notifications to strengthen the system especially the substance of the law <clears throat> and streamline the procedure for governance something that is sorely missing and very highly inadequately addressed require attention and that is communitarian collaboration in the entire system of governance 
Just to give an example, there is something that is in application in United States. There is something called as a Clean Water Act, very much related to our Water Act. There, statutory status and functions are conferred upon some of the local communities who have been very closely associated with the resource and they appear to be part of that resource itself. They are called as water keepers. You know the kind of functions they have? <clears throat> These are not government bodies. These are not state functionaries. These are not public servants. But these are the people who are drawn from the community itself. They have that skill, they have that ability, they have that observation, they have been living there all the while. They are given powers of imposing penal sanctions and enforcing them <clears throat> on those violators of all that has been prescribed in the law of ensuring good quality of water in terms of riverine system, water bodies and things like that. <clears throat> Such things require a far more serious consideration and space in the system of brown aspect of governance. Let's go to the forest and wildlife bureaucracy. My God, it's a altogether a different approach and attitude. This is a fairly well protected superior creator of bureaucracy. And what do they do? They handle a wide variety of statutes. But the approach is the same. Not that of an expert professional, but that of a hardcore bureaucrat of the revenue kind. I have already explained that. Please recall that by referring to the forest and wildlife law and their management. The system of governance, as you have noticed, it is state-centric and highly centralized. Unfortunately, it follows the undesirable hierarchy of administration, being next in status and importance to revenue administration and police. Actually, such a kind of a hierarchical structure and recognition of status actually makes forest and wildlife governance a real casualty, especially when it comes to developmental decisions, the forest and wildlife authorities conservation concern, even when articulated in the higher circles of administration, do not get the kind of respect as would that of those who are in the higher echelons of the ladder of administration. Police administration is supposed to be a strong ally, especially with regard to seizures, searches and bringing the wrongdoer to book through prosecutions. They hardly cooperate or even follow instructions of the forest administration. When you look at the forest and wildlife law, the striking feature is the museum view of the West. There is a little scope for application of conservation promoting native wisdom and practice. The kind of relationship that exists between the local community, the forest resources, the wildlife, the very symbiotic relationship that exists between them is hardly respected, <coughs> acknowledged or accommodated. Protected areas as they exist, they are under severe stress. They continue to be prone to encroachments, overgrazing, touristic pressure, poaching and ever increasing demand from diversion for developmental purposes. Study shrinkage of corridors are a regular feature. I think the Forest Wildlife Administration have very similar problems of pollution control boards. They do not have 
well equipped and well trained guards problem of personnel ha huh. there is no dearth of officers in the forest and wildlife departments because they occupy higher positions and quite a few of them are even deputed to perform functions which are totally alien to their office they become registrars of universities or heads of information network systems and this is something which is despicable to say the least if you want to strengthen the administration at the forest level if you have too many release it of bulk and those that are there completely zero them on to the task on hand that is the professional approach that is what is required sadly missing the next problem is about the problem of coordination and integration of different agencies task to protect like for example wildlife because in terms of protection of wildlife there are so many things that are required so many other agencies of state are required to assist in search seizure and prosecutions for forest and wildlife related offenses there is a problem of effective access to and use of criminal justice delivery system and you know the consequence the conviction rates are very low although this law is considered to be far more stricter stringent than the penal laws that we have but in terms of conviction very low rate you know the reason of course these are really the problems of administration and it is my considered opinion that these which are in existence are something that has to be handled on a priority and capable of getting ad addressed by affecting systemic corrections you don't need legal reforms you correct the system itself to reanchor them to achieve the goals that are set under this law most of the problems as i have said so far would be resolved <clears throat> reform in access to and securing criminal justice and to that end there is definitely a need for bringing police and revenue administration to get trained and also to get guidance and instructions from forest and wildlife authorities is a very immediate and an imperative need the final one is something that requires repeated emphasis and action in that regard and that is communitarian engagement this has been completely overlooked and you know the results are not encouraging we already know we have success stories the whole world have taken have taken note success stories in which the contribution of local communities are quite overwhelming in saving protecting and conserving forest and wildlife without state assistance and they are plentiful if you just look around they cannot be continued to be ignored any more by the concerned authorities look at the existing provisions they have enough space for this kind of a thing like village forest or community reserves under forest and wildlife laws there is definitely a need clear administrative will for giving effect to them or to go a little bit more in detail you have known about the maldharis their kind of help in conserving one rare species and variety of a mammal the gir lions in gujarat or the contribution of naga tribals in making nagaland the amur falcon capital of the world and look at the human service rendered by the pastoral community of the thar desert in conserving the great indian buster these require recognition their contribution 
greater illumination, not illumination out to the outside world, it's already known. <clears throat> not illumination for the common man, it's already in common domain. Illumination within and inside the forest and wildlife administration to give recognition that they deserve and internalize them in the working of this law. Certain other problems and difficulties, of course, they are very, very fundamental. And these are like climate change in relation to protection of wildlife or something which is what we are experiencing now in dealing with zoonotic diseases. You don't have to look for an example. We are actually going through that. The COVID is actually a zoonotic disease. And you know, as a matter of fact, over 60% of these, 70% of these are supposed to originate in wildlife. You turn the pages over of all the laws and procedures and institutional arrangements that you have on forest and wildlife. They are totally clueless in dealing with any of them. And so there is a need for a relook into these laws, the administration, to rejig them, to rework them, to recast them and put them on professional lines to achieve the goals for which they are created. <coughs> Biodiversity law. That has salutary elements of decentralization and a huge chunk of it would involve communitarian engagement and communitarian engagement how? It is not just as participants but as stakeholders, partners, statutory functionaries, right holders in a far more meaningful and deeper sense than perhaps even under the constitutional scheme. This requires to take its pride of place in the system of green governance. There is also a need to look beyond the tunnel vision of the forest and wildlife law. Integration of forest, wildlife and biodiversity under one single overarching law and administration is the need of the day and that should be the primary part of law reforms. There can be serious thought given to crafting a single comprehensive overarching legislative frame is a thought on conservation, protection, maintenance, management, non-degradation, restoration, recovery and reclamation of natural resources. And of course, the environment with specific divisions under the umbrella law to take care of different aspects to bring them in the much needed coordination, harmony and working among the different units. The unnatural watertight fragmentation of the green and brown aspects of environment should become a matter of history. This is one model of reform. Not an ideal, but can be given a thought and to the extent possible operationalized. But if you think that it is too idealistic, too broad, too very difficult, here is another alternative. Each aspect of governance may be left to separate legislations and the institutions under them as you have right now. But you need an enabling legislation having a high powered steering body headed by none other than the chief secretary of the state that would overarch, oversee, monitor and enable all these institutions under each of these laws and to bring in the much needed harmony in the working. Then only administration will become a symphony of a well harmonized, well knit organizational entity rather than 
the cacophony of chaotic administrative arrangement as we have right now. In the entire environmental statutory formulations, there has been one gap and that is there should be an insertion of what is called as a sunset clause. What is this? Sunset clause is a provision which actually makes it mandatory for the lawmaker to have a relook at the law that he has made. See, a law has been made and brought into application. And more often than not, the lawmaker, after having made the law, forgets about how it is being implemented how it is effective and how to take a performance audit to bring in corrections. But supposing you have a provision which has a clause, this is very much prevalent in the western states, in the western countries, where they will have a provision for periodic review of the law made and then take a call whether you need an amendment recasting to meet the demands of the time. This can only ensure the law can remain in dynamic ferment and not ferment and rot like an unwanted, unused, rotten food of yesterday so as to become useless. So dynamic fermency, which is supposed to be the hallmark of a living law, if at all it were to happen, then you make the lawmaker compelled to have a relook at what he had done earlier as part of his lawmaking process. These perhaps can bring in the much needed reform in the whole system of governance and in the legal order in the days to come. The next aspect that we need have to examine is to look into what has been done about justice dispensation and whether there is anything that need have to be done to reform that or are we happy with whatever we have right now and that is the third part of our inquiry adjudicatory processes mechanisms and the results of 